going to hit record. Yeah. And I want to thank everybody for com uh, coming to tonight's programs, New Directions for Clematis, with Linda Butler, who is the curator at the Rogers and Clematis Collection here in Westland, as well as an instructor in horticulture, uh, in the horticulture department at uh, Clackamas Community College. So thank you for uh, pushing through your Wi-Fi and coming and speaking with us tonight. Thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, I'm gonna mention also that I'm also the author on two books of Clematis, about Clematis from Timber Press. Hopefully the Westland Library has them. Or we will get them. <laughs> thank you. Um, came out in uh, 2004 called uh, Gar Gardening with Clematis. And then uh, the most recent one was part of their Plant Lover's Guide series in 2016, Plant Lover's Guide to Clematis. And have you lost me? Nope, you're still there. Okay, I can't see you guys. And I'm well, getting a post attendee Zoom message. Oh, that's strange. Okay, I'm just gonna go have that go away. Yeah, you just have that go away. <laughs> Very odd. Um, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. And uh, I asked, uh, let me get my sh uh, share screen. And I asked Sarah if it would be okay for me to riff for about 10 minutes um, on um, the his a little bit about the Rogerson Clematis Garden and the um, um, and the the history of the collection and a little bit about how I became associated with the collection, what I do as a curator. So, um, Sarah, you're going to have to guide me. Uh, and let me know what you guys can see. Right now it's waiting to share. Um, so why don't you continue along your spiel and we'll be able to <laughs> let you know. Yeah. When the, if, so. To me, it's looking like we're starting to share. Um, but come on. Okay. So I'm getting to the first slide and I'll hit how I want to view it. I can get, yes, we can at least see your screen. So I'm happy about that. <laughs> so uh, the Rogerson Clematis Collection was started by Brewster Rogerson. Come on, full screen. Let's do it. Um, 50 years ago. He was a professor of English at Manhattan. He was having a house built for himself and decided he liked the idea of a vine covered cottage. And so he, come on. Sorry, this is just. Um, taking so long. So of course, uh, so you're trying to rush and, it and you're in the middle and it's like, no. Um, and so he went out and bought four clematis. They were all um, more or less what you would call large flowered hybrids. And that included clematis jackmanai. Um, before I get too far into this, I want you to notice how I'm saying the word clematis. It's based on the Greek word clema, which means vine. The only accepted secondary pronunciation of the word clematis is the American pronunciation clematis. And I hear people from all over the country say, oh, I'm from Houston, I say clematis. And, or I'm from New York, I say clematis. All Americans say clematis. It's not regional here, uh, but it's not 100% correct. 
because we're Latinizing Greek when we say the word, we're not Latinizing Latin. So we're Latinizing the word clema, so it's clematis. And so that's how I say it. And I said clematis for 35 years uh, until I came under the influence of Brewster Rogerson, uh, who says everything correctly because he was a professor of English and his specialty was um, Shakespeare and Milton. So no messing about with him. Um, so this is a little talk that I put together a while ago, uh, sort of going over the history of Brewster and the collection. And when he bought those first four clematis, if you can, are old enough to remember back to what gardening was like in the 1970s, uh, it, it was sort of in the doldrums. It wasn't the national pastime. It wasn't America's greatest hobby like it is now. Uh, it, um, there weren't a lot of books and the sort of real popularity of English gardens that came into the United States in the 1980s and 1990s sort of hadn't happened yet. So he couldn't find out a lot of information. But by 1975, he had 50 clematis and he was calling himself a collector. Uh, among other charms, Brewster was a gin man. Bombay was his brand and he had very firm opinions about what was a martini and what was not. Um, so when he retired, so his retirement from Manhattan, Kansas to, to uh, Oregon was sort of two stage. He took a sabbatical in 1978, 1979 school year and spent it in Oregon, in Eugene. Um, he was able to use a vacant lot that was owned by uh, OSU Extension for, I think that's Lane County. And um, it was right across the street from the apartment that he rented. And what he was trying to do on his sabbatical was amass enough information that he could write the first American book on Clematis in 75 years and really bring the genus up to date with how uh, gardeners were using it, what there was to find, sources, the range of colors, all that, all that stuff, and how growing them in the United States and various parts of the United States is different from, say, continental Europe or Canada even. And so um, that was his mission for his sabbatical. But by the end of the year, he had decided he was going to retire and move to Oregon because growing them in zone eight was better than growing them in zone four. And so he went back, taught one more year at K-State, sort of wrapping up his tenure there. And then in the summer of 1980, he drove all of the rest of the collection uh, out here. Uh, he told vivid stories of driving up the Columbia Gorge as the Mount St. Helens was <laughs> erupting uh, that year. And then he bought a little house in Eugene and lived there for about five years. But right away, he realized that the, the real sort of uh, hub. Oh, did we lose that? Oh, I'm sorry. What can you guys, Sarah, what can you guys see? Sorry, we can see uh, new directions for Clematis, up is not the only direction, and then expecting value. Okay, let me escape. Oh, we're back, okay. Uh, so um, he moved up to Oregon and for a long time, for almost 18 years, the collection was housed in a private wholesale Clematis nursery, one of their extra greenhouses. Uh, that was Gutman Nurseries, which is west of North Plains, outside uh, off of Highway 6 as you're headed, or 26 as you're headed to the coast. And in exchange for housing his collection, Brewster wrote their catalog for the wholesale nursery. Um, but he, in 2001, he was diagnosed with macular degeneration. And so all of us that were friends of his and 
um, started getting together Mike Darcy, uh, radio and TV personality, folks from Portland Parks, uh, Sean Hogan at Cistus, Morris Horn at Joy Creek Nursery, me just at the time as a garden writer and avid clematis grower myself, uh, started helping Brewster look for a place for the clematis to go. And ultimately, Mike Darcy, who lives in Lake Oswego, contacted them because he knew they had bought Lusher Farm, which was um, over a 100-year-old farm. It had been a dairy most recently when the Lusher family had it for 50 years. And uh, in the fall, late fall of 2004, we started negotiating with the to move the collection on to the Lusher Farm site. And we actually did the move in early December of 2005. And the garden uh, started actually being created in uh, autumn of 2006. And uh, the front bank, which runs along the public pathway in front of the farm, uh, was started in 2007. It's been building and building and building uh, since then. We have a test garden where we trial new plants and we also um, observe new species that are about to be introduced or uh, not introduced, but documented. Um, Brewster has his own area, uh, the founder's garden, where he got to choose which clematis would go there. Um, so there's about oh, a little over 40 different species and cultivars that are grown in the founder's garden. Uh, we've done a lot of building, um, but people tend to think that if we have, as we do now, 2,000 clematis, then we must have 2,000 feet of fencing or 2,000 arbors, and that's really not the case. Um, we've hosted the International Clematis Society twice in 2010 and 2019 so that they can see what we're doing. And 2012, we got a big grant from Stanley Smith Horticultural Trust in the US, uh, and they paid for a lot of upgrading to our pathways so that they're ADA approved for the most part. I started uh, being paid to do what I was already doing, which was to curate the collection in July of 2007. Curators make labels and they make notes and curate, it's the curator's job to know what we have, where it is, is it alive or is it dead? And if it's dead, why did it die? I also protect seedlings from overzealous volunteers and I do a lot of wildlife management because we are an all organic farm at Lesher Farm. Everything that goes on there, whether it's us, uh, friends of the Rogers and Clematis collection, or whether it's the city of Lake Oswego, their community gardeners, or 47th Avenue Farm CSA were all organic. So attracting birds and keeping track of the birds that we have, watching for the killed deer nests and making sure they don't get stepped on. Um, that's all the job of all of us who uh, work at the farm. I also get to designate who our volunteer of the year is, which is one of my favorite parts of my job. And in 2015 and 16, we built in, we built out the last big part of the garden to be complete, which we call the modern garden. Here we feature large flowered hybrids um, post World War II that don't fit into any of the other niches in the garden. And in that part of the garden, we have used strawberries, edible strawberries, eight different varieties as our ground cover, the the shade in shaded feet for the clematis. And that's been really fun. Our visitors love to graze on the strawberries. Most of the ones that we planted are uh, ever bearing varieties. Uh, we did keep the June bearing variety named Cavendish, which consistently won our, um, our uh, strawberry tastings that we do every year, usually around the solstice in June. We have a few signature plants, really museum quality clematis that Brewster was able to preserve over the years based on just um, the luck of when he started uh, collecting plants. And um, so some of the clematis that we have are quite old. Uh, we take a lot of cuttings. We do a lot of propagation of the really precious things. 
we share plants that we think are important with partner nurseries like Joy Creek Nursery in Scappoose and Brushwood Nursery in Georgia. Um, they have a lot more capacity than we do to, um, to propagate and to get things out. They're mail order nurseries. We are not. Uh, we are a botanic garden. So get stuff to them and then they, they get it out into the broader clematis market. And uh, as Sarah was saying before, this was a big year and last weekend was a big weekend. We had the dedication of a beautiful um, functional statue of a Circus canadensis um, made for us by my friend Joe Henderson, who is one of the senior gardeners and metal workers at Chanticleer, which is an estate garden outside of uh, Philadelphia. Um, it's quite a wonderful garden. And Joe is a remarkable man, and I was simply amazed when he, um, I was talking about the possibility of, of us doing an art installation this year, and he said, uh, tell me what the deadlines are, and you know, he, he made it, and uh, so it was really great, and we had the dedication, so that picture there is of me on the phone with Joe as we're doing the dedication, so he could be uh, part of that. Uh, so that brings us right up to date with the uh, friends of the Rogers and Clematis Garden. And so let me get back to the presentation for today. And um, come on. While that's happening, I am dropping Linda's two books that we have in our system uh, into the chat box so you can access it, although it totally looks like one. There's technically two there. Several available, so. Okay, I'm, so I'm, my screen is sort of frozen. <laughs> if it can go wrong tonight, it seems to be going wrong, so. Um, let me switch over to the tonight's presentation. Close that out. Okay. And I can see that. Okay. So let me go to. Uh, Yeah, we're sharing. Trying to get Adobe to open up. Mm -hmm. It's open. There we go. There. I'm looking for show hide. No, no, no. Theme. Uh, you could go full screen mode. Yeah, I guess mm -hmm. that's, that's going to let me do. There we are. So Sarah asked me to do a talk that uh, I update from time to time, but it's called New Directions for Clematis. And what um, I originally created this Mock for a gardening group in Kansas City, Kansas. And they, the organizers of the talk said, when you drive through Kansas City, Kansas, you see clematis on mailboxes, you see them on uh, front porch structures, uh, like wrought iron railings, and you see them at the lamppost at the head of the driveway, period. So we're going to think outside the arbor. We're going to think out, outside the built environment. And we're going to look at how clematis naturally grow. And then some sort of ideas for not always necessarily having them go relentlessly up. Come on. 
There we go. So first I want to talk for a minute about how clematis <laughs> grow. Um, clematis grow by wrapping their leaf stem around a structure. So here you have a clematis doing just that. Um, the leaf stems on the underside have sensitive cells. When those touch something, the sensitive cells stop growing, but the cells on the other side of the stem continue to grow, and you get this whipping, hooking action, and it wraps around whatever it's touching. And that can happen on, a, on an 80 degree day in about 15 minutes. Uh, in the winter, it can, it, can take over, um, it can take over 24 hours for a clematis in a greenhouse that's still trying to grow and hasn't gone dormant to do that wrapping around. So how is that different from other vines? Uh, wisteria, honeysuckle climb by their actual stems winding around things, uh, like a boa constrictor. Ivy, climbing hydrangea, form little sort of sucker structures, like little roots that actually go into the surface of what they're climbing on to hold them in place. That's why they can climb up a rock wall. Um, something like peas or um, grapes form a little tendril. So like right here at the node where we have the leaves coming out of the main stem of the clematis, on a pea or a grape, there would be another little structure that doesn't have a leaf on it. It's just a long little piece of vine that wraps around things that's separate from the leaves and it's separate from the main body of the stem. So clematis climb by wrapping their leaf stems around things. So that's how they, how they do it. Now, not all clematis climb. A good 25% of the genus, there are 325 species, 25% so of those are not climbers. And a small number of those are actually woody shrubs. The ones that, that the majority of those, however, are herbaceous perennial plants, like a hosta, like a daylily. They come up in the spring from an underground crown where roots turn into shoots and they flower. If you cut them back this time of year, it's Bastille Day, and we do a lot of Bastille Day chopping at the Clematis Garden. Uh, they will rebloom, uh, and, and a lot of Clematis will, not just the herbaceous perennial ones, but the herbaceous perennial ones then will die back in the fall. All of the structure that's left of that plant will go dormant and will not rejuvenate. It, it just dies off and the crown forms new growth every year. Just like a hosta, uh, daylilies, scabiosa, uh, black-eyed Susans, any perennials that you grow, there are 25% of the clematis species that are just like that. And that's quite often news to people that there are clematis that don't climb. So let's talk about growing them through shrubs. For clematis, this is not a new concept. This is how they grow in the wild. So um, in my garden, um, this was taken a few years ago. We've taken out some of that arborvita hedge. But on the right, you see how clematis are typically grown. I will say clematis make great hedge binder for arborvita hedge. If you've got an arborvita hedge and if it's incredibly rainy and windy or if it gets snow and the snow load splits it, if you've been growing a big Clematis Montana, that one's Clematis Montana Var Wilsoni, which is known as the super fragrant one. If you're growing that, that is climbing up there and it's holding all of the arborvita together. Um, so it makes good hedge binder. But if you want something smaller, something more uh, compact and easy to grow, uh, the clematis on the left is called Sally Cadge, and she's covering the bare legs of a climbing rose um, that gets much taller than that particular clematis does. In another corner of my garden, I have used Etoile de Paris to sort of define the corner. 
So as you walk around this brick pathway, there is, um, and you can just see the top of it in the, in the upper right-hand portion of the slide, a wonderful uh, viburnum called Viburnum tinus bulis variegated. And it's evergreen. It has a wonderful cream-colored margin around the edge of the leaves, but it flowers in the winter when the clematis is dormant, and it just makes a very nice partnership, and it gives um, some structure to the clematis uh, as it flowers. And clematis structure doesn't have to be big. If the clematis is big, you just need to provide it with a lot of points of contact. So this is a split rail fence that we have at the Rogers and Clematis Garden, and it borders the driveway and our um, backyard habitat area. And if you look carefully at this picture, you can see the fencing cloth that we use, and you can buy this plastic coated green, you can buy it, um, galvanized like it is here or green or black and these openings are about two inches by three inches and the more points of contact your clematis have to wrap their leaves around and the smaller diameter it is um, the more secure your clematis is going to be staying where you want it to go so you've probably if you know clematis you've probably heard of pruning groups you're not gonna hear anything about pruning groups from me tonight. That is old thinking. Uh, the clematis don't know what group they're in, they're in, first of all. And secondly, there are some breeders using clematis species that have never been used in hybrids before. And it becomes very difficult to know how to assign those clematis, those new hybrids to a pruning group when we don't even know really they haven't had a lot of trialing. We don't know what they're capable of doing in a garden. So the number one thing you want to think about when you're pruning is the health of the plant. And that is the major consideration. If you see part of the plant collapsing, if you see um, some dead growth or it's the end of winter and the lower parts of the plant are leafing out, but you've maybe got two or three feet of dead growth at the end, cut any dead or collapsing parts of the plant off as soon as you see them, period. And you can do that any time of year. Um, if you've got parts of the plant that are collapsing, it could, it's most likely in the Pacific Northwest due to some sort of environmental problem, some breakage. Um, I had a plant that cats continued to fight on, on top of because I didn't know that I was barging into somebody's territorial imperative when I planted my plant. Um, so then I put some fencing cloth around the clematis to protect it until it got up into the tree I wanted it to go in. Um, but I kept thinking, oh, it's, it's got some sort of pathological problem. It's getting some sort of fungal disease and it keeps collapsing. No, one morning I went out and there was just cat hair festooned all over the thing. And then I understand, and it was kind of crushed, and I understood what was going on. So we use a lot of this fencing cloth um, and we just stapled it inside the split rail fence so that this clematis can just run along the fence and have the whole fence to itself, uh, but we don't let it go up. It only gets to go horizontal and decorate the fence. And again, um, using clematis that don't get very tall to decorate the bare legs of, of other things, in this case, an old magnolia, that was at Lusher Farm. And some people don't like the bare legs of their shrubs, their lilacs, their roses. I think kind of a trunky old look to a plant gives the garden sort of a gravitas, a sort of old eminence gris, if you will. It makes the, the garden look like it's been there for a while and not quite so new. But some people just don't like that trunky look and they want leaves from the ground up and you can do that with some of the shorter growing clematis. Um, this is Lady Caroline Neville. She's actually one of our heirloom clematis, um, but just read the tags and see how tall it's supposed to get. Uh, figure in the Pacific Northwest with our really great soil and our good climate, 
most clematis will tend to get a little taller than they're advertised. But, um, and look at how the plant's growing in the pot when you go to buy it. Uh, some clematis, as they mature, they lose their lower leaves, and that's just a healthy function of their growth. But again, that makes them look stemmy at the base. But those new leaves that are so big and lush in the spring are there to get that clematis going. And once the clematis is in active growth, it's going to shade its own lower leaves, and those lower leaves are going to die back. It's nothing you've done wrong. It's just something natural that happens. And not all clematis do that. So if it bugs you that your clematis by the end of June or early July has gotten all stemmy at the bottom, yank it out and try another one that you like. There's lots of clematis to experiment with. Uh, Countess of Lovelace has been a really wonderful old heirloom clematis that has uh, done really well in partial shade and looks great rambling through some of the old hydrangeas that were left at the farmhouse um, that we have saved. Although how much we've saved them from our 214 degree high on June 28th, uh, how well they come back remains to be seen. But um, we do have hydrangeas that have done super, super well. Um, the PG hydrangeas, the paniculata grandiflora forms, like limelight, doesn't show any damage at all. And we have two different forms of the oak leaf hydrangea, hydrangea corsifolia, that's native to the East Coast and the Appalachian forests. Um, we have peewee, which stays small, and amethyst, which gets a little larger. And the panicles start out kind of creamy colored and turn this amethyst purple color as they age. Both of those have been absolutely cast iron through all of this. Um, we did water well. Uh, we did a lot of late day evening watering so that the plants could rejuvenate overnight in between the hot days. Um, but um, anyway, there are hydrangeas that work in extreme heat. Uh, we've learned that. And the clematis really enjoy and make beautiful pictures growing through them. And of course, to me, the highest calling that you can have is putting different kinds of clematis together. So this is in our heirloom garden. These um, clematis here and over here that have sort of the canoe-shaped sepals, they do flatten out eventually, is an old French variety called Madame Grange. Another old French clematis from the Vitacella group is Alba Luxuriance here. And then another old French clematis, I say three amigos, but um, they're really amis, or however you would say, plural of, friend, of friends in French. Uh, this is Colette de Ville. And as far as I know, we're the only source for this plant right now, Colette de Ville. Brewster originally got it from a nursery that no longer exists down in California called Chalk Hill Clematis outside of Healdsburg. And um, they now are totally specializing in growing clematis for the cut flower trade and they don't sell or mail order plants anymore. But he was good friends with their wonderful farm manager, Murray Rosen, and Murray was able to import this for Brewster um, so that Brewster could have this old French variety that he hadn't had before. Um, so we're going to be sharing this with um, Brushwood Nursery, and hopefully they will get Colette more widely available back into the trade. Um, clematis and roses. Um, roses are woody shrubs. We kind of pretend they're something other, but they are deciduous woody shrubs. And they combine with clematis really, really well. And with climbing roses, um, you don't do a lot of pruning with them. So really for the roses or for the clematis that grow in them, uh, a lot of the pruning we do is limited to just deadheading the clematis so that we get them back into bloom fairly quickly. Um, 
Zephyrine Drew in the rose you see here is a, an old garden rose, but a repeat bloomer. And so we want to keep, oh, well, this is in my garden, but I want to keep the show going. So I'm deadheading the rose and deadheading uh, the clematis so that they do come back into bloom. And whenever I do a major deadhead, which is deadheading is just taking off the spent flowers so they don't try to form seeds. When the clematis start forming seeds, all of their energy goes into trying to form seeds. And the seed heads are attractive, but I'm more interested in getting them to bloom again because I love the flowers. And so I take those seed heads off and that makes the plant say, oh my God, I'm trying to reproduce myself. I'm trying to, to form seeds so I can reproduce myself. So if my seeds are gone, I'm going to try to bloom again. And so that's the whole point of deadheading is to get them back into bloom more quickly. And that's what we do deadheading with roses too. And deadheading just means taking off the spent flowers. If your clematis is getting a little rangy and you feel like it's getting out of control and it's time to deadhead it, you can do what I call hard deadheading, which is instead of just taking off the spent flower back to the next node with two leaves on it, you can take off another foot or two and um, it'll branch and bloom again from as far back as you cut it. So if you do that this time of year, again, it's the best time for the Bastille Day chop. Um, you will get rebloom usually by late August, early September. And, um, and that rebloom can happen in ways that are sort of unexpected. This is uh, Clematis Bildelion uh, from the late 1880s. It's one of the first Clematis uh, that was bred with an American native called Clematis Texensis to get uh, more strong, uh, red coloration in the large flowered hybrids. In the spring, this flowers at the Rogers and Clematis Garden with a once blooming rose called Hebe's, uh, called Lita. And Lita has beautiful white, very, very double flowers, and then a, a reddish outline that's the same color as the outline of the petals you see here on Ville de Leon. So that's a great color combination. But then in the fall, the rose doesn't read bloom but Ville de Leon does, and rather than going up, it sprawls across this wonderful uh, bank of lady in blue asters. Those asters are only about 15 inches tall, so that gives you an idea of the level at which the clematis is blooming. If they don't have anything to go up, then they spread out. And let's talk for a minute about clematis in containers because a lot of people these days have smaller gardens. And so to fit a clematis or two in, they really need to grow them in big pots. If you go to our website, um, rogersonclematiscollection.org, and you go under clematis, we have care sheets and there's a care sheet called clematis contained. So I'm not gonna answer a lot of questions now as far as pot size, that sort of thing. I'm just going to show you some of the things that you can accomplish and how we sort of judge whether a clematis is going to be good in containers. So this is pilu. Uh, the translation from Estonian, it means little duckling, and that's the trade name that you see associated with it. So you've learned at least one word of um, Estonian tonight, and I guarantee you're going to learn one more. Uh, but this is Pilu. This is at a coastal garden. This is at Rockaway Beach. That pot is about 20 inches deep and about 16 inches wide. So it's deeper than it is wide. Clematis roots tend to go out and then they go down and they'll fill in the pot on their way down to the base. Um, this plant is watered several times a week. It's not as hot down there as it is up here. But here in the greater Portland area in West Lynn, if it's going to be over 90, you're going to be wanting to water your clematis in containers every single day. And if it's over 100, you'll water them morning and night. You, they're not low maintenance plants, and very few of them are xeric, meaning they will become um, top drought tolerant over time. Um, but this is Pilu. It flowers 
It never gets more than about six feet tall, which means it's very easy to control on a small-ish structure. So I'm 5'5", five five, and I'm just a little bit taller than the top of that structure um, right there. Me pointing at it doesn't help you any. So I will get the cursor over there. Um, and look at how much bloom. And another way to judge a, a clematis for containers, it's blooming from the ground up. So the more you can see them and, and get around and look at them, go on garden tours, see if people are growing clematis in containers. We have a few clematis con in containers at the clematis garden. Uh, come by and have a look. Um, and then look at our clematis contained handout. And it has a list of clematis that we recommend for containers. And they are social climbers. So if you go back to this picture, and we're going to key in right here, it's decided that it's going to look really good in that hanging basket. It's not planted in the hanging basket. It just aimed for the hanging basket. But there are a few folks that are actually breeding really super short clematis. They do climb. Their leaf stems do wrap around things. But they stay really short, and they can be used in a hanging basket. But think of how much water and how much fertilizer it takes to keep a hanging basket look really good. And that's, it's going to be the same for clematis. You can't ignore them. And for clematis in containers, we recommend uh, liquid water-soluble tomato fertilizer that's got magnesium sulfate in it, also known as Epsom salts. And that uh, helps reduce um, yellowing in the leaves because they tend to be, uh, they tend to go through their magnesium in the soils pretty fast. So tomato fertilizer is a great blossom booster uh, and we recommend it for clematis that are uh, in containers. So here's kind of fun, uh, clematis in a big uh, terracotta pot, but it's leaning onto a woven bee skep. Uh, but I thought that was very pretty, very clever uh, to have it lean on something else as a prop. And this is mini Selic, another Estonian clematis. Mini Selic is the word for mini skirt. So that's two very useful words of Estonian. You've learned mini skirt and little duckling. Um, mini Selic flowers when it's only three feet tall. So this structure you see here is three feet, that finial at the top is three feet above the surface of the pot that it's growing in. And we also have this, uh, this is one that Brewster wanted uh, in a container in the founder's garden. And so it's there in bed 16 if you visit the garden. And of course you know, I'm assuming that the garden can be visited from dawn until dusk every day. It's in a public park, there's no admission charge, and it's free parking. Um, so, you know, it's light until nine. So when I'm done blathering, you can drive up the hill on Rosemont and go to Lusher Farm. And um, Mini Sea Lake is starting to look a little bit tired because it's been in bloom for over a month. Um, but we'll go in and deadhead it. Uh, give it some um, tomato organic, we use an organic liquid tomato fertilizer, and um, it will have it back in bloom in the fall. Uh, Raymond Evison is a fairly well-known modern clematis breeder. Uh, Brewster first met him in 1977 on Brewster's uh, first trip, and Raymond was probably in his late 20s or so. Um, so he um, is, his nursery is on the island of Guernsey, and he puts plant breeders' rights on his plants. So they have this sort of funny nomenclature where there's the name he wants you to call the plant, and that's a trade designation. This is the actual cultivar name of the plant. And I'm not going to get into plant breeders' rights and the difference between plant breeders' rights and U.S. plant patents because that's a whole other talk and you'll all leave because it's super boring. Uh, we see this Evapo number, as we call it, 
um, associated with the plant, you'll know that that's a Raymond Evison plant. And uh, so this is Rebecca. And so she's actually planted in the pot. So are the sweet peas. And then she climbs up into a climbing rose um, at my house. This is Great Western. And so she, I'm here, I'm using the container to sort of get her up in the air so that she can then climb on up into the rose because she wouldn't quite get tall enough if I didn't have a two foot container um, to lift her up. So I mentioned before that some clematis are shrubs. So there are clematis you can grow through shrubs and there are clematis that are shrubs. And all of the shrubby clematis are um, deciduous. They all die back in the winter. So this big coarse foliage here is on, associated with these little clematis flowers here, clematis tubulosa. Those individual flowers are about the size of a hyacinth floret. So imagine spring blooming hyacinths with the individual florets. They are beautifully fragrant. Some people say it reminds them of suntan lotion. Um, and I say that's, that's pretty good, sort of a nice tropical, very warm, uh, fragrant scent to them. And here's another um, Ville de Leon. This, so this Ville de Leon is actually planted in the ground between this euonymus and this hydrangea. And it came through the hydrangea and said, I'm going to flower in a woody shrub that happens to be a cousin. So these flower, um, the woody clematis flower in the summer, they're in full bloom at the clematis garden now. Um, and many of them are scented. And what we've discovered is that the more intensely colored they are, uh, the more scented they are. So this is Clematis tubulosa. It has a woody base, very coarse foliage, and it flowers July into August. And so this is a hybrid of that and another cousin. Um, this is Alan Bloom. Again, this has plant breeders' rights, so Alan Bloom. It's named after the great um, nurseryman Alan Bloom, who has had blooms of Bressingham Nursery. Now it's run by his sons. Um, but again, this is a woody shrub, forms a woody base. So the way that we maintain these is in the fall, when they're done flowering, we take off that wand of, of flowers. Um, we leave that big coarse foliage on. Here you see it. Here it is, a new stem coming up over here. And we leave that on, and it looks tatty through the winter, but those leaves fold down. And the theory is that those, those leaves turn brown and they fold down, and they're protecting the buds that are lower down on the plant. Then in about March, we go out, clean off all of those old leaves, and we look for the new buds down low on the woody shrub base that is above ground and we cut down to the best buds. And then it takes them usually till about early July to really get flowering. Uh, Catherine's amethyst is a shorter variety. Uh, this was a chance seedling that came up in the garden of Dan Long in, um, Brush at Brushwood Nursery. And uh, when, before he moved to Georgia, he, when he was in Pennsylvania, which is where he grew up, he married Catherine. And Catherine loves amethyst. It's her favorite gemstone. So this very, very purple version, um, Dan named for her. But Catherine's a Georgia girl, very homesick. So they ended up moving back down to Georgia. Um, and then this frothy thing down here, is another Japanese shrubby clematis. This is clematis stands. And in Japan, they cut these long wands of uh, stems back and use them as filler in flower arrangements. And that's a very interesting, was a very interesting thing for me to see when the International Clematis Society went to Japan, is how many clematis that they grow and of course, this one's native to the northern uh, islands of Japan. 
how many clematis they grow for the cut flower trade, both as a focal flower, but also as filler. So these flowers are, again, they're shaped like a hyacinth floret, but they're teeny, and they're kind of a sky blue to pale blue. Um, and this picture is in the founder's garden. This is one of Brewster's favorite uh, species, and certainly his favorite of the shrubby clematis. So while we're talking about a clematis used as filler in flower arrangements, let's talk about clematis used as filler in your garden. Um, so clematis recta is a wonderful, somewhat erect and upright going or growing herbaceous perennial clematis. This is native to the steppes of Eastern Europe, down into um, Tibet, or not Tibet, uh, Turkey, over to Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and a lot of those uh, Stan countries that have steppe climates and steppe geography or geology. Um, so a steppe climate is the next wettest climate after a desert. So we're not talking a lot of water. There's no, there are no broadleaf evergreen plants native to steppe climates. So there's not a lot of cover. There aren't a lot of conifers to climb into. And actually apples were originated on the steppes as multi-trunked um, fruit bearing shrubs. And then of course, humans got involved making, using them to make cider, and then eventually coming across varieties that were sort of accidents um, that were sweet and then learning how to hybridize more fruit apples that are eating apples. But um, anyway, even apples are children of the steppes. So that's where Clematis recta grows. So it is, and many of the Clematis native to the steppe regions are herbaceous perennials. They just die back in the winter. Their roots are super hardy. So this plant's hardy to zones three and four, and then all new growth from the base every year. And like really good herbaceous perennial plants, they're easy to divide. And we recommend that you do it every three or four years, dig them up, hose off the root mass so you can see what you've got and pull those pieces apart, uh, give them to your friends. It ends up being a little bit like zucchini in August, but um, you'll run out of friends eventually. Uh, but um, this is a great filler and it has a wonderful light scent to it, which I think is one of the reasons the Japanese like to use it in flower arrangements. So here we have it uh, making a nice bright com red, and, um, red and white combination at the height of summer. You would see this now. Um, this particular garden, I think, was uh, in, in British Columbia. And um, anyway. Very handsome, very sharp, and fragrant um, combination of plants there. And closely related to Clematis recta is Clematis manchurica, native to Manchuria. Uh, so that makes the species names easier to remember. And here it is paired with an herbaceous perennial uh, Clematis that people really love called Arabella. Manchurica also has beautiful seed heads but we usually don't save the seed until it flowers the second time and we let it go dormant and form seed in the fall. But for us, since the Clematis collection is a public garden, we want the Clematis to be flowering as much as possible. So right now, most of our Clematis Monturia specimens are um, just starting to go to seed, so they're gonna get a Bastille Day chop and they'll come back and flower again in the fall. Alba luxuriens is, um, is a climber, uh, an old French variety, but really good at growing horizontally and making great partnerships with uh, really striking herbaceous perennial plants like this Actea. Um, if you're questioning what this plant is and you've always seen it known as Simisifuga, Part of my job as curator is to keep up with the ever-changing world of nomenclature, or as one garden writer calls it, nomenclutter. Um, but I am, part of my job is to keep things labeled and up to date.
but I love this uh, color combination that the, um, the Clematis sort of did uh, with the Actea all by itself. And another uh, Clematis that is not a climber that makes a really great filler and especially can be broad and horizontal is Clematis durandii. This is a very early hybrid that is um, across, there are about three really founding species of all the large flowered hybrids. Large flowered hybrid Clematis come from large flowered species. And the large flowered species mainly um, grow in China. Um, Clematis uh, patens is in China and Japan. Uh, but this one is an example of a large flowered species called Lanuginosa crossed with Clematis integrifolia, which is about an 18 inch tall herbaceous perennial. And the gene for not climbing that comes with the herbaceous perennial clematis is extremely dominated. So if you use a big, large bodied, large flowered hybrid and you cross it with clematis integrifolia, a somewhat short herbaceous perennial clematis, you get a big floppy herbaceous perennial non-vining clematis. So it's nice to be able to use these plants horizontally. It's great to use them. Here they're filling in um, a planting of a stilby, but you can also plant uh, these clematis in amongst your roses and they'll just spread out through them and their flowers will pop out with the roses. Um, basically, if it's gonna look good in a vase, it's gonna look good in your garden together too, growing in the ground. So uh, Clematis durandii is extremely popular with people who know Clematis. And it's even on the list of recommended Clematis that is maintained by the International Clematis Society. And if you go to their website and look for their recommended list, there's about 60 Clematis on there that are cast iron and foolproof. Um, so this is something new that um, uh, I'm seeing more and more when I get to go to Europe. And hopefully someday I'll get to go to Europe again. Um, Clematis grown as ground covers. And this is done both with Clematis that climb and Clematis that don't climb. So in this case at the Rogers and Clematis Garden, Clematis Canada had a perfectly fine four by four post with a mason bee condo on the top to grow up. We even surrounded it with fencing cloth. No, plant decided, I'm gonna look really good in these antique ferns. I'm an antique, I'm going to grow horizontally into the ferns. And we just loved this very cool, beautiful in the shade, in the dappled shade uh, color combination, um, kind of calming. Uh, to see the green sort of reflected up out of the white of the flower. If we had decided that we were going to take these stems that were going horizontal and that we really want, we were going to bend them and put them and tie them up. We use Velcro tape uh, to tie them up to the upright post that we had for this plant. Probably what would happen is that at the point where we bent it up, and where it attached to the main stems, it probably would have broken because that, that connection between the branch and the main stem can be sort of brittle. And that's why you wanna make sure your clematis are well, well tied, that they have something to hang on to. But if you go out and you're working with your clematis and you have a branch that's going that way and you don't like it and you want it to straighten up, and you straighten it up and you come back two days later and it's collapsed, that's on you. You broke it, accept it, deal with it. And if you have clematis that are going in a direction you don't want, that's the second priority of pruning clematis, getting it, training it, getting it to go where you want. So if it's going horizontally and you don't like where it's going, instead of fighting with it and trying to get it to go up and risk breaking the part that you bent, the thing to do is cut it off. Just get rid of it. 
If you have a clematis, then you want it to go up to your second floor balcony, but you don't want to jump into the maple tree that's right by your balcony and it's wanting to grab it, slap its hands. Cut off what you don't want. And that's another kind of pruning that you can do any time of year. If it's going where you don't want it to go, cut that part off anytime. Doesn't, doesn't matter when. Uh, so this is six plants of a cultivar, and I'll show you a close-up of it in a minute, called Cezia Pizza, because it's just easier, and everybody knows what you're talking about. But Cezia Pizza was bred in the uh, Soviet Union during the Cold War, and it is an herbaceous perennial plant, and there are six plants of it in here. Now, the herbaceous perennial clematis tend to get sort of stemmy uh, down in the base. And there are some um, herbaceous perennials like Veronica that make this beautiful mound with these beautiful blue spikes. And then we get like an August rain and the whole thing flattens out and you're looking at just the basal stems and in kind of a circle with the flowers out at the edge. Um, these clematis have a tendency to do that too. So what this grower did is he planted them close enough together that the flowers are flowering over the bases of the other clematis. So they've made this sort of web of six plants, but once these all go dormant in the fall, they can go in and cut them all off at once and tidy up, put down some mulch, and these guys are all gonna come back and intertwine, but they're not climbers, they're not grabbing hold of each other, and that makes the maintenance super, super simple. And that's Cezia Petitza. Um, we've had really good luck with Helena Knoll uh, getting her to grow horizontally. This is a clematis bred in Poland by Vladislav Knoll. And if you know clematis, you might know the clematis called Niobe which is, is his most famous introduction. Um, but here, this plant has been perfectly happy to come over into this purple emperor. Um, uh, sedum used to be, now it's hylotelephium, but they used to be sedums. The big, the tall showy sedums now are in this genus. And this sort of reddish, very dark um, stamens uh, in the middle there are, sort of reflected in the sedum. And you can, you can get away with some really subtle color combinations like that. And then this nice bright uh, Cedrus Diodora in the background that has this sort of celadon green color to the new growth. A kind of unusual, but I think very nice, very simple color combination. And some clematis can, can climb to eight or 10 feet tall and they choose not to. Uh, this is Serafina, uh, an introduction from Poland. Um, it was bred by brother Stefan Franczak in Warsaw. And um, so this plant, we have it on a tall obelisk, rusty metal uh, hoop, giant hoops go over each other. And Serafina, once in a while, will send one stem up the obelisk, the rest of the time it just pools up and it's like a pool of water um, around the base of the obelisk. And we don't know why, but we work with it. And one who was really slow to get up into its apple tree is uh, Danuta. And so here are two specimens of Danuta that are choosing not to climb but it gives us this multi-layered effect. So here is one Danuta that's going up in the apple tree and then the others are not. And so it's like this buildup of these pink flowers up into the apple tree and the apple only has to hold on to one of them. But that's something that the clematis did by itself. Um, Inspiration is a lovely pink non-climbing clematis. Um, the trade name is, or the cultivar name is Zoan. And we love this color. And in this case, Bill McKenzie is actually climbing into that Physocarpus summer wine and 
um, the inspiration is sort of romping around in the lower branches. Um, so it gives you a lot of activity, um, uh, lots going on in this picture, uh, but a really nice sort of trio of darker and lighter color harmony with the pop of yellow. And draping, yes, there are clematis that will drape. And if they have nothing to grow up, they will drape down. So this is a picture at my house. In this case, Perrin's Pride does have a perfectly good rose just off screen here, uh, stage left and uh, stage right for us as viewers. And um, it's chosen to drape down the retaining wall, which I'm actually quite pleased about because it's kind of a boring cement retaining wall. And there's uh, Perrin's Pride uh, draping down the front of the retaining wall. And another plant that was originally selected as a draping plant, although it can climb, is lemon bells. So the University of British Columbia Botanic Garden sent an expedition off to China, or to Korea, and they came back with a bunch of seedlings of Clematis coreana, and this one flowered yellow with just a little dusting of cinnamon over what Mary Toomey calls the shoulder pads of the Clematis. And there are some little tiny spikes there, like the back of a delphinium, or the back of a larkspur flower, or the back of a columbine. And yes, those are all in the same family, ranunculaceae. So this is where we see one of the family resemblances between uh, Clematis and all of its other cousins. But when I first saw the first plants of this at the University of British Columbia Botanic Garden, they had a big, deep wooden planter. They had it lined with a metal liner and Lemon Bells was draping all over out of the front of it. They hadn't given it anything to climb on, so it made a beautiful drapery out of itself. And this is a native from um, the Wenatchee area of Washington. One of our members who lives up there um, went out and collected seed for us. And um, it has uh, sort of finely dissected leaves compared to um, the more typical forms of Occidentalis. And it comes in a wide range of colors. So when we plant it, we know we're going to get blue. We might get this violet color or we might get white, um, but it's nice to be able to grow this from seed. And this plant is a rambler. And again, it can climb, but it's where it's native to, it tends to grow on the shady side and then grow up over the top into the sun. So the roots are shaded and then it's growing up over the top in sort of high pH, very sandy, rocky soil um, up in the the mountains out of Wenatchee and in the Entiat area between Wenatchee and Chelan. So um, it wants to drape over a rock, it can drape over a really ugly brick planter and help us cover it up. Uh, so this is, I think, one of our last pictures, but this is a combination from my garden. This is uh, Clematis Miranda, this is a non-climber. Uh, but I get such a long period and such enjoyment of bloom out of this. It blooms for a couple of months and it starts out with its partner being the tall bearded Iris Penny Lane. And then not in bloom yet, but the foliage is right here, is a perennial pea that gets about two feet tall that is Lathyrus um, Arantica. And I get that from Dancing Oaks Nursery when I need to replace it. Um, it has little orangish flowers, so I sort of have this chartreuse blue, lavender, and, um, and some shade of orange or really gold, deep gold uh, going on with this uh, clematis for several months. And uh, because this is an herbaceous perennial non-climbing clematis, I can deadhead it and keep it blooming for most of the summer. So thank you all. Thank you especially for your patience. And uh, I hope you'll 
think it was all worthwhile once we uh, once we got once we got going. Yeah, uh, way to persevere through the internet. I mean, <laughs> you think they would be cooperating by now, but. Um, so if you have any questions, I mean, we have just a little bit of time for questions. I would love if you had anything specific since you stayed until the end to get those answered. Uh, one person submitted a question ahead of time and uh, you mentioned how some, you know, nothing will ever become uh, drought resistant. So for the sun loving um, drought tolerant plants, um, will they need more shade as our climate heats up? Well, that's interesting that you should mention that. We have a list, if you go to the Clematis you know, website uh, and you're looking at the Clematis contained list, you'll see another list there called Some Like It Hot. And the Clematis I mentioned briefly in the talk, Clematis Texensis, mm -hmm. native to Texas and the hill country around in Texas, um, it didn't miss a beat. Ours at the Clematis Garden is in a very sunny, full sun site. It's got gravel and creeping thyme at its feet, so it has no more shade at its feet than that. Uh, and then it crawls up some chain link fence. It's right outside where you go into uh, where we have our sales plants. And that Clematis, some of the flower colors bleached out a little bit when it got up to 111 and 114. <laughs> But now it's just like, bring it. That was great. Here's all my new buds. Aren't they gorgeous? And the hybrids of that plant are very distinctive because it has an urn-shaped flower that's not terribly large. But when it is the seed parent in a cross, that shape is given to the progeny only usually larger because they tend to cross it with a large flowered hybrid. So uh, Princess Diana, for instance, is a cross between Clematis texensis as the seed parent with a very common, old, lovely, uh, large flowered hybrid that's striped called Bees Jubilee. So Princess Diana is half texensis and half Bees Jubilee, but it inherited that urn shape, but, you know, three inches long instead of one inch long. Loves the heat. Uh, there's a red one, Grave Tide Beauty, that you'll want to look for. It is probably as close to true red as any Clematis can be, and it's a Clematis Texensis hybrid. When you come out to the garden, if you want to see a lot of these Texensis hybrids in a small space, you want bed 14. It's the front bank, and it's right out in full sun, south, south to southwest facing, and it's as close as we come to a rock garden but it is watered and we water it when it's over 90 we're watering it every day uh, but we water it from the bottom so the clematis that are growing up at the top get less water than the ones that are at the bottom because gravity works and so the grave type beauty that's planted up at the top is in full bloom right now it said okay i got some heat i'm growing really fast and i'm gonna bloom so look at our some like it hot list. I do believe there's a clematis on there that we will be taking off of that list. And that's uh, an old pink variety called Comtesse de Bouchot, a large flowered hybrid that under normal circumstances does really well in the heat, but that's a hundred degrees or less. And when you have that exponential rise, you know, where you're getting up to 114, um, she did not like that. Mm -hmm. So it didn't kill the plant, but it looked really awful. So we've cut it back and she'll come back. The, the wood is still green and she'll flower again later in the season, but she did not like it hot. So when you're reading the list, just blip right over that name because, um, not really hot. So anyway, look for the some like it hot list. And those are clematis that either want a really hot spot, but shaded feet, or they can take sun from the ground up. Uh, excellent. And then um, the person that was here earlier, he, he uh, shared with us one of his awesome, um, uh, his new cl uh, clematis. I'm sorry. I, I'm still trying to train myself to say it the, uh, the proper way. I'm not going to 
correct you. Uh, you know, you're not so, wrong. You're just not as right as you can. Right. Um, so that was just getting started. So for those who are, you were talking about Bastille Day and a cutback, for those who are just getting their plants established and they're kind of growing, what are some key timelines for like training and cropping? You mentioned okay. some of them, like if something's starting to go the wrong way and you don't want it, clip it uh, and stuff like that. Any, anything to get it going this season so when it, um, so at the beginning of next season, it will do what people are looking for. Okay, so the third, we talked about the most important pruning rule, if there is such a thing, is to prune for the health of the plant. Don't leave dead wood or collapsed wood on it. Um, just it's thinking that anything is going to rejuvenate is just magical thinking. And to have have foliage that is you've left on the plant so it can die back, uh, how is that ever going to be a good thing to do? So always always clean them up, and hygiene is really important. Secondly, we talked about slapping their hands if they're going where you don't want them to go, and 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 providing structure, providing shrubs so that, that as they expand, they will be held up and, and growing through things that you want them to be growing through. And then thirdly, pruning to get it to flower when you want it to flower. Now, certain clematis are hardwired that they can only do one thing. And that's really typical of like the evergreen clematis, clematis armandii. It's only gonna flower in March and April. So you don't wanna hard prune it in January because you're cutting off what's about to bloom. So prune it after it's done blooming. And so we're talking about pruning it in May. And if you prune it that early in the year, you can prune it as hard or as little as you want because it has the whole growing season to recover and the next year, by the next March or April, when it's getting ready to bloom, you're going to wonder why you didn't prune it more than you did. <laughs> yeah. And the same with the Clematis Montanas. I showed you Elizabeth early on on the split rail fence. That plant can get 30 feet tall and it flowers in the spring. It may put out six more flowers in the fall, but not worth worrying about. So. If it's something that normally flowers early and you really need to get it under control, as soon as it's done blooming in the spring, do what you need to do to whatever degree you need to do it. Keep it well watered, give it some, in the ground we use, uh, people always ask about fertilizer, we use rose and flower food. Um, if we can get it, we use the Rose Society's Gardener's Gold um, and that's, I think, why people a lot of times grow clematis and roses together is because they have the same sort of fertilizer regimen. They like the same sort of fertilizer. Mm -hmm. So it, right after you've done a really hard shot on a really big plant, go ahead and give it some fertilizer, keep it well watered, and should be no problem. It's got the whole rest of the growing season to recover. Um, we have clematis at the clematis garden that flower from November to March. November to March, the winter blooming clematis. And the hardest thing about growing them is remembering to fertilize them in October and November because that's when you're telling all your other plants and all your other clematis to go to sleep. I'm not giving you any more fertilizer till it's time for you to wake up in the spring. But you guys, I know you're gonna bloom through the winter. So let's give you a little boost right now uh, in the autumn, hard to remember to do that because we're really hardwired that we want to, we're having the rest of our garden go dormant. Most people are growing the large flowered hybrids. I call them the showgirls. They are the rockets of the uh, clematis world. Um, big, showy, great, bright colors. And um, those, you have a lot of options in pruning. So stop thinking group two or group three, because if you hard prune them in the winter, they will start flowering later than if you just prune them by half. If you just prune them by half, they'll flower in April and May the first time, and then you deadhead them, fertilize them, and get them to rebloom. But maybe if it flowered where you have it, it's gonna flower with your rhododendron and it's gonna clash. Mm -hmm. Maybe what you really want is to dress up your rhododendron 
so that it's not just a green blob for 50 weeks out of the year. So you're gonna hard prune that clematis so that it flowers after the rhododendron and the rhododendron becomes the living structure for your clematis. And you can do that. It's depending on when it blooms, depends on when you prune it. And I learned this at home with my own mistake. I have a wonderful big purple uh, Estonian clematis called Viola. And I was reading the prevailing wisdom from the breeder in Estonia who said, hard prune it in the winter. Well, they have a different climate than we do. Uh, but I would always go out and hard prune it in the winter and it would flower in late June and into July. But one year I forgot to prune it. And I was looking out my bathroom window at the climbing rose that it grows into uh, called Great Western. And you saw a little picture of that earlier with Rebecca. Um, but here was this big, these big purple flowers in the middle of the rose and it was gorgeous. And I went outside and it was Viola. I had forgotten to prune it. It was stunning. And I have been forgetting to prune that plant ever since. When it's done blooming uh, right now and that particular rose doesn't rebloom, now is the time for me to go out and cut Viola back, uh, clean it up. It, it, makes, it makes a pretty big plant, so I, I wanna get it back under control. And it will flower a little bit in the fall if I go out and prune it right now. So it really is learning what the plants are capable of doing, learning, deciding what you want it to do, and then pruning it to make that happen. So if you're here hoping I will magically explain groups one, two, and three to you, sorry, I'm done with that. I have moved on. So, listen to your plants. Yeah. Yes, listen to your plants. Prune off what's dead or not healthy, prune to train it, and then prune it to get it to bloom when you want it to bloom. And that's it. That's easy. Excellent. Well, I hope you all go visit the garden. It's uh, stunning. And I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. And thank you so much for uh, staying with us at the beginning and coming and listening to this fantastic presentation. Yeah. I mean, and Sarah, thank you so much um, yeah. for uh, first, first of all, for setting this up and then for, um, for your patience this evening. Thank you so much. Well, I hope you all have a fabulous rest of your evening. And again, this will be made available as a recording later. So you'll all receive that. And then I'll include the links. I've already included some of them, like to your books, as well as to the, um, the PDFs about care that you were talking about. So you should receive those in the follow-up email as well. So thanks, Sarah. Thank you, yeah. everybody. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks.